We've come here to train the mind. And the problem is the mind has to train itself. Which means that when you're sitting down here, the mind is in at least two sections. The part that wants to do the training and the part that wants to be trained, or the part that's going to be trained. And the part that is going to be trained doesn't necessarily want it. And even the part that's doing the training is not necessarily all that wise. So we're training all the parts of the mind. Which is why this takes time, because we're going to be sorting out a lot of things inside. Which is why we don't focus directly on the mind to begin with. We focus on the breath. And even with the breath, sometimes it requires that we do a little thinking first about why we might want to stay with the breath. It's one of the reasons why we have those chants at the beginning of the meditation. We reflect on aging, illness, and death, the facts of separation. Not to be pessimistic or to be dark and depressed. But to remind us that these are real problems in life. And some of, it, of our culture points us away from paying attention to these things. The basic attitude is, well, you can't do much about these things anyhow, so you might as well not even think about them. But they are the big facts in life, the big things that cause us to suffer. And the Buddha's message, of course, is you can do something about them. Even though aging, illness, and death and separation are going to happen, you don't have to suffer from them. The suffering is the big problem. And then the fifth contemplation, the contemplation of the fact that we're the owners of our actions. We're heir to our actions. In other words, what we do is going to have an impact on us. This actually points the way out. This is our treasure. The actions we do in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. These are the things we take with us. These are the things that keep meeting with us in, in life, the results of our actions. So what do you want to meet with? What do you want to take with you? And where do actions come from? Well, they come from the mind. Because that's a good reason to meditate right there. Gain some control over your mind so you can begin to trust it. Then when an intention comes up, You'll be able to see it for what it is, skillful or unskillful. And if you see that it's unskillful, you have the desire and the strength and the skill to be able to say no effectively and not turn into some sort of psychological mess all tied up because you said no to the things you really want to do. You have to learn how to not want to do those things. That's for things that are skillful. It may be hard. You want to train yourself that you have the strength and the willingness to follow through with them. So there's some good reasons to meditate right there. Then there's reflection on the, the Brahma Viharas, wishing all beings to be to be happy. Those who are suffering, may they end their suffering. Those who are already happy. May they continue in their happiness. You think about, of course, the fact that you are one of the beings you want to see happy. But at the same time, if your happiness depends on making other people miserable, they're not going to stand for it. They're going to try to destroy whatever your happiness is. So if you want happiness at last, you have to take the happiness of others into consideration. So that's another good reason to meditate, because meditation is a way of finding happiness inside. That doesn't harm anybody at all. And then finally, there's a reflection on equanimity, realizing that there are some things we simply cannot change, and some things in life that we have no control over at all, and primarily the actions of other people. They have the right to choose whatever they want to do. 
and they'll be the results of your own past unskillful actions that are going to come up and they're going to cause some pain. And even the results of your past skillful actions come up and they cause pleasure, but then the pleasure is going to go. Or if you hold on to the pleasure, then it turns into an unskillful mind state. So you've got to be very careful. This is where equanimity comes in. I can't let myself be tied up in making my happiness depend on the ups and downs of other people's actions or even of my own past actions. What do you have left? You have your present actions right now. This is where you do have some control. You can decide where you're going to focus your mind. You can decide what you're going to do with it, which is another good reason to meditate, so you can learn some skills to get to know your mind really well. And where you see that it's heading off in a wrong direction, you can move it in the right direction. And when it's moving in the right direction, you can encourage it, keep it going. So all these are good reasons to meditate. Good reason to develop good qualities in the mind, which is what we're doing as we meditate. The word for meditation in Pali, bhavana, literally means that, development. We're trying to develop concentration by keeping the mind with one object, the breath. And we bring other qualities in as well. We bring mindfulness in, in other words, the ability to remember. Mindfulness in the, in the Buddha's use of the word does not mean just watching things coming and going or being open and accepting of things. And it actually has direction. Its direction is to remind you of what's skillful and what's not skillful, and what lessons you've learned from the past in dealing with skillful and unskillful things that you can remember that helped you get past some unskillful thoughts that were threatening to take over your mind, but you learned how, not, how to say no effectively. In times when you're able to give rise to skillful qualities, when it seemed like that was the last thing that the mind wanted to do, but you were able to find the strength, find the resources within you to do what was right. And here we develop that quality, that develop the ability to remember by keeping the mind with the breath and reminding ourselves again and again, stay with the breath, stay with the breath. That's mindfulness. Alertness is actually watching what you're doing, watching what the breath is like and watching what the mind is like right now, what it's doing. And there's a third quality with ardency in there, desire to put your heart into this, to do this well. And that's where those motivating factors come in to remind yourself why you might want to sit here watching your breath when there's so many other things you could be doing right now. You realize all those other things you could be doing. are simply feeding off the results of your past actions and not necessarily developing good qualities of the mind. Whereas here you develop good qualities. You're developing goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others. So you find ways to give yourself pep talks to stay right here. And that also helps if you can learn how to really get to know the breath. So you figure out what kind of breathing feels good, what kind of breathing feels right for the body right now. And what are the body's needs right now? Is it tired? Can you breathe in a way that gives it energy? Are you tense? Can you breathe in a way that relaxes you? And which parts of the body feel good when you breathe in breathe out? Let your attention settle there, and then think of that sense of comfortable feeling, refreshed, energized, just right. Think of it spreading throughout the whole body. This is why John Lee talks about using the concept of breath energy, the idea that there's an energy flowing through the nerves, an energy flowing through the blood vessels, and it's related to the in and out breath. Can you think of the breath nourishing the whole body? So it feels good to be here. You can win over some, some of those parts of the mind that are not necessarily sure they want to be here meditating right now. You can show them it feels really good. Something simple, just like this, being with the breath. It 
Here's a pleasure that has no, no drawbacks, causes no harm to anybody. And when you learn these skills, you can tap into it whenever you want. And having a sense of inner well-being that makes it even easier when you're tempted to do something wrong, to be able to say no, because you've got something good already. The, most, the reasons we make unskillful choices is usually because we're hungry for a little hit of pleasure. There's a certain pleasure in, in greed. There's a certain pleasure in anger. And it comes really easily. And so when you're feeling starved, when the mind is feeling starved, but for some entertainment, for something, and it doesn't have anything good to focus on, it'll go for whatever. So you want to give it something good to nourish it. That's for anything. Thoughts that may come up while you're working with the breath, that are thoughts that are not related to the breath, you can just let them go. It's very common. All kinds of random things will come up, and especially as there's less and less surface activity in the mind, things will come bubbling up from within. There's another reason why we have that chat on goodwill at the very beginning. You start thinking about incidents from the past or things that you did to other people or other people did to you. And you remind yourself of the principle of karma, where the errors of our actions. What that means is if you try to trace back who was really at fault, your finally keeps going back and back and back. Because when we have our notions of fairness, they usually come down to the fact that there was a beginning to the story, and then someone was the first person to do something wrong, and then someone else responded and may have overreacted. And you can kind of tally up the score. But in the Buddha's view of time, there is no beginning point where you can say the story began here. It goes back many lifetimes. So the idea of assigning blame or getting really upset about these things seems less and less worthwhile. So the best thing is to extend thoughts of goodwill to everybody involved. Make up your mind that if it was you who made the mistake, you don't want to repeat that mistake. If you're the person who was wronged, okay. it doesn't help anything to get upset about that. Learn how to have some forgiveness for everybody involved. And learn how to make that your default reaction. So whatever threatens to come up while you're focusing on the breath, that threatens to entangle you and pull you away, you can cut through the tangles pretty quickly. Now, this doesn't settle those issues once and for all, but it does enable you to develop some skill in the mind. So that as your concentration gets stronger, your discernment gets more refined. Because the more still you can make the concentration, the subtler the things you'll be able to see. And if you're tempted to take on a particular issue, you can watch yourself. To see what happens. And if you realize that you're not handling it well, you can pull out. You have to save that issue for some other time. Because the big issue right now is how to get the mind to settle down with a sense of well-being and be happy to stay here. So as the Buddha said, all things that we experience, everything in fact, aside from nirvana, comes from desire. Our unskillful mind states come from desire. Our skillful mind states come from desire. So a large part of the meditation is learning how to train your desires in the right direction. We're not trying to snuff out desire right away. Eventually you get the mind to a point where it doesn't have any need for desire anymore, and that's when I can put it aside. But until that point, you've got to learn how to train your desires in the right direction, because they make all the difference. 
everything is rooted in what you desire. So that's one of the reasons why we have these contemplations, to help you motivate yourself to want to want in the right direction or to desire to have desire in the right direction. This is why when you read the Dharma talks of the Tianchans, huge percentage of them are basically pep talks. So that the listeners will stay motivated to realize that their actions really do matter. And it's a good use of their time to learn how to train the mind. So that this source of action will turn out good actions, will produce good things. Because we have this tendency that we all want happiness, and yet we do things that cause suffering. And sometimes we do it because we don't believe our actions have any impact, or we have some misunderstanding about what our actions will accomplish. But when the mind is well trained, you realize that the source of happiness is in the mind. It's through what we do and say and think based on our intentions. And that we can train the mind. And so these contemplations are there to keep the mind motivated in its training. So the part of the mind that's doing the training and the part of the mind that's being trained. learn how to work together. The part that's doing the training gets more and more skillful as it becomes more and more observant. And the part being trained finds that it really is good to be trained. And that's when the whole mind becomes something you can learn how to trust.